All right. Well, thank you for joining us again for the final stage of our program. This is going to be our question and answer session. Uh, I'm going to ask some interesting questions, I hope. I once scared off a, a uh, young man at my second grade field trip once when we went to a museum because I kept asking him questions that he didn't know the answer to. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully this won't happen this time. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions for about 30 minutes and then we'll open up the floor and y'all can answer or ask some questions for of your own. So uh, first, um, when did you first become interested in science? A lot of, a lot of things in my life have been accidental. <laughs> I, when I was in uh, high school, I was looking, somehow I would gotten the idea that I should be a minister. And I had the idea that God would forgive me for all the bad things I'd done if I was a minister. So that was kind of motivated me. And let me turn this chair just a little bit more. <clears throat> and... So I went to my pastor of my church, I was an Episcopalian, and I went to my minister of my church, and I asked him, well, what do, you, what do you do to become a minister? And I don't know if he didn't like his job or what, but he didn't give me any encouragement. Maybe he just knew who, what I was like. <laughs> he didn't give me any encouragement at all. I mean, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> So I went to my guidance counselor in high school, and she had been a missionary over in Africa, and was a return missionary in the public high school. She was a guidance counselor. So I, I had asked her, and she said, well, you don't want to be a minister. They don't need ministers over there in Africa. They need doctors. So I said, okay, well, I guess I have to do medicine then. So. <clears throat> So I went off to college, and of course I enrolled in science classes, and that's the rest of the story. From then on, I just loved science. And it was fascinating and challenging, and and uh, I ended up uh, after I I became an Adventist when I was in the, my freshman year, and then I went off to La Sierra College. For, I was at San Diego State University for two years, and then my last two years I did at La Sierra, and when I was there, I a um, my my biology chairman of our department took me aside one day. He says, "You don't want to do medicine." He says, "They don't they don't need any more people in medicine. Go do something worthwhile with your life." So <laughs> he said, "He said go off and go off." He knew I was interested in philosophy of, of science and these issues in creation and evolution. He said, "Go off and do something worthwhile with your life." So I said, "Okay." I didn't want to do it because. I already was accepted in medicine, and, and if you're a physician, you already know, once you get into medical school, you're pretty much going to get out. But it's not the same with a PhD. You actually have to do something unique, and I, I just didn't know if I could do that. So I was a little scared, but I trusted God, and uh, the rest is history. Uh, why is evolution specifically so popular still? There is a famous story in biology about a frog that if you put a frog into a pan of water and then you gradually heat it up, the frog won't ever detect the difference in temperature and so it'll stay in there until he cooks because the outside temperature and the inside temperature always are the same. I, I think when evolution was first presented back in the 1850s, it seemed like a plausible explanation that took God out of the picture. So people that wanted to have a reason not to have God in the picture 
And the best reason, or best reason, or worst reason for that is because you're doing things that you don't think God approves of. And there were plenty of us around that were like that. So the idea caught on rather quickly. Now we can get rid of God. As, as uh, Richard Dawkins says, it gives me the ability to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist because I have an explanation for origins that doesn't involve a creator. So I think that motivation is powerful. I think it originally motivated people like Thomas Huxley and others uh, to push Darwin's ideas. And then once you have gotten that idea accepted, then gradually, even though you learn more and more and more information that doesn't agree with the idea of evolution, you're still trying to fit it into that paradigm so it stays around. So I, I think there's there a majority of uh, the people in, in evolution couldn't answer that question themselves. They'd say, well, what else is there? And if you said creation, they would just laugh because they have been taught that evolution is the only thing out there. But it's not. Uh, most of the time when we talk about long extinct animals, the first thing that comes to mind is dinosaurs. But something like 90% of all animals are extinct. Why is it that uh, dinosaurs sort of get the spotlight? Uh, if if you look at the you look at the trade of dinosaur people that work in dinosaurs, almost all of their effort is focused on producing books that will appeal to children and young people, because guys, for example, they think dinosaurs are really hot stuff until they discover girls. That's all. That's the only thing in their world, <laughs> and so. I think just the idea that you have these gigantic extinct animals that that uh, roamed on the earth once it has a cachet that, that promotes it. And I think that's why there's so much interest in it. If it weren't for kids, dinosaurs, well, for many years, they weren't really recognized widely. But in the late 20th century and the 21st century, the promotion of these ideas to young people has, has really made a lot of money for, for people working in dinosaurs. So kids do rule the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of arguments that people make for evolution is that um, dinosaurs turned into birds. They evolved into birds. and a lot of dinosaurs do have a lot of bird-like features. Um, how is that explained? Dinosaur promoters realized that they were working on a dead-end project. They didn't have anywhere to go with it. Uh, but if you've ever worked with chickens, you know their legs are covered with scales. And lizards have scales. So if we can find dinosaurs that have feathers, then we can put the whole thing together. Um, and so that, that kind of led to this idea that dinosaurs are, and birds are to say that birds are dinosaurs. And now we can tell kids, well, the dinosaurs aren't extinct. But it doesn't work. You know, nobody's going to trade a T-Rex for a turkey. It's just, <laughs> just not. It doesn't fly with young people. They, they are not dinosaurs. Uh, they are not dinosaurs. Birds are not dinosaurs. All dinosaurs, the one characteristic they have in common is that their uh, hip has an open space in it for the femur to be inserted, whereas all other animals have a closed acetabulum, that's what it's called, a closed place where the socket of the hip is. And so birds don't have an open acetabulum, they are not dinosaurs, but uh, a lot of scientists still call them that because it's a popular thing to do. And scientists are people. They're like you and me. They don't want to be different. Once somebody sets the stage, then they want to follow along with the same ideas. Birds were here before dinosaurs. There's one right, right out here in West Texas. 
well, I guess this is in West Texas, Texas, North Texas, but West Texas, uh, they found a bird that was from the Triassic about the same time as the dinosaurs. Mammals were the same time as the dinosaurs. So uh, the birds, the dinosaurs that are supposed to have given rise to the birds don't occur in the fossil record until long after the birds are there. So this whole idea doesn't hold together very well. But still, we find feathers on dinosaurs, or at least uh, that's the appearance. And uh, so they say, OK, well, these have to be birds then. But you know, there are scales on birds and scales on on other reptiles. So they can be feathers on birds and feathers on other reptiles without them being the same thing. But it, it is a, it is largely a PR driven thing though. So uh, sort of along the same question, for me personally, um, is Archaeopteryx a bird or a dinosaur? I've heard people say both. <laughs> I was just going to answer yes. <laughs> but you beat me to it, so you're too clever. Um, it has bird-like characteristics, and it has dinosaur-like characteristics. It has a long tail. Uh, it has a furcula, which is both birds and dinosaurs. Um, it has teeth in its mouth. It has claws on its wing, but it was obviously a flyer. Uh, it could be an amalgamation, or it could be that the original serpent that was in the tree in the Garden of Eden wasn't a snake, because if it had been a snake, God would have told it to go on. It wouldn't have told it to go on its belly. It was already doing that. So it could very well have been something like Archaeopteryx. Uh, that was uh, a very spectacular beast with, with amazing colors on its wings that lighted in the tree and tempted Eve to eat the fruit. So we, don't, we don't know the answer to your question. <laughs> um, is there one specific thing that people can point to that proves creation or points to it? Okay, first of all, and this is not a criticism of you, but science does not prove things. It may be a surprise to you to learn that, that scientists never should cherish the idea that they're going to prove anything by science. All science can do is try to find the best solution for the time being. It's the weight of evidence. The only place you can use proof is in logic and mathematics, and you cannot use it in science. So um, that, that aside, again, that's not a criticism of you. It's what I hear from my students every day, and I teach them that they should never use the word, and it shows up in all their papers and in their exams. <laughs> <laughs> but any, in any case, it's hard to get rid of that idea. That, that we can prove anything in science. And I now I've talked so much I've forgotten your question. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. What 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 can we say about the evidence for creation and evolution? Let me just state outright that I think God does not want us to have proof. Uh, because he has given us his word and he has given us the ability to talk to him and interact with him personally. And he wants us to trust him. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? And if you read chapter 11 in Hebrews, about which is the faith chapter, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, if you see something, then it's not faith. Amen. And, and what does he talk about next? By faith, the heavens were established and the earth. So he's talking right about creation in that context. And he says, you're going to have to exercise faith. And Jesus says, am I going to be disappointed when I come back that people have thrown away the idea that they can trust me? And uh, so I, I think God is not in the business of giving us absolute data. Uh, he could easily do it. We could find a human down in the Cambrian or somewhere. Uh, it hasn't happened. We haven't found any giant humans in the fossil record. And so I, I'm pretty 
confident that God is not going to give us ultimate answers in this life. However, the weight of evidence in molecular biology is accruing rapidly and it's becoming more and more difficult for anyone to entertain the idea that the complex structure of life could have happened by accident. Especially when nowadays with all their sophisticated understanding of things, we actually can't tell you about a single protein or a single uh, structure in a, in a cell that could have happened. We can't explain how anything could have happened by any rational pathway. And it's not getting easier, it's getting harder day by day. I could go into a lot more detail on that. So, so uh, we, we have strong evidence that supports the idea of creation. However, there are things we don't have good answers for, and one of these is, is radiometric dating, the, the ages that, that the radiometric dates are interpreted to give millions of years. Um, I, it's silly to try to make up stuff to support that, uh, to, to, to counter that. It's easier for me, I tell my students this, just tell people I don't have an answer for that. I believe it's wrong, I believe it's interpreted wrong, wrongly, but, but I don't have a good answer for that. And by the way, while we're on this subject, would you tell me how life started? <laughs> so uh, how are fossils, uh, how, how are they age, or how do they determine what their age is, and is there any way to accurately determine a fossil's age? All, all the radiometric dating methods, except for radiocarbon, only date rocks. They only date volcanic rocks. Only radiocarbon dates can be applied to the fossils themselves. And radiocarbon dates are subject to different criteria than the other dating uh, methods because radiocarbon is made in our upper atmosphere right now. So radiocarbon is made from nitrogen by bombardment of, with a cosmic ray, an oxygen neutron out of a uh, nitrogen atom, and then that neutron hits another nitrogen atom and knocks out a proton, and that leaves carbon. So carbon is made from nitrogen in the upper atmosphere all the time. As long as the Earth's atmosphere is in equilibrium, then we have a certain concentration of radiocarbon in our environment. The plants take it up. It's made into carbon dioxide in the upper atmosphere by interaction with ozone. So ozone converts the newly made carbon into carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is taken up by plants. The plants are eaten by the animals. So we now, you could stop eating, but if you keep eating, you're in equilibrium in terms of your radiocarbon because you're taking in radiocarbon in everything you eat. And then that's uh, distributing <coughs> itself in your body so that when you die and you get buried in the ground, your radiocarbon clock starts ticking. While you're alive, it's in e you're in equilibrium. So you're taking in more radiocarbon all the time and you're getting rid of it. And so you're in equilibrium. But once you die, you're out of equilibrium. And the longer you rest in the ground, the more radiocarbon you lose. It converts back to nitrogen again. So after 5,000 years, your body will only have half as much radiocarbon as it has now. After 10,000 years, it will have one-fourth. After 20,000 years, it will have one-eighth, and so on. So uh, 15,000 years, sorry. Every, every 5,000 years, it cuts the amount in your body in half. So if we know the atmospheric concentrations of radiocarbon and we know the organism was in equilibrium, then we can be very confident that the dates are relatively good. And so that's, that's good to know, but how do we know about things in the past? Suppose at the time of the flood there was no radiocarbon in the atmosphere. And at the time of the flood, as, as cosmic ray bombardment started, the radiocarbon started building up in the atmosphere, and so organisms that lived very close to the time of the flood, they'd be taking up radiocarbon from an atmosphere that had much less radiocarbon. Therefore, when they died, they'd have a lot less radiocarbon. And therefore, 
when we dig them up, they're going to look a lot older than they really are. Is that clear? Yeah. yeah. So this is a problem because nobody was around to check to see yeah. what the equilibrium was. It takes a few thousand years for equilibrium to be reached, and the Earth's uh, magnetic shield is variable. We know it gets stronger and weaker through time and may even reverse, probably does reverse. And so there are times when the Earth's uh, rate, of, rate of cosmic ray bombardment will be much higher than other times, and there'll be much more carbon uh, produced in the atmosphere than, than at other times. So all these variables make it difficult to be very certain about radiocarbon dating past a few thousand years. A few thousand years back, we can be fairly certain because we have internal checks, we can check it against the biblical chronology and things like that, so we feel like this is fairly confident. But then to extrapolate back to infinity is not a good idea. And so when you get dates that are, as we're getting on dinosaur bones that are supposed to be 65 million years old, they've been dating some of these and they get 26,000 years. And if they date uh, carbon deposits like coal, they should be infinitely old if they're 300 million years old, but they're finding some radiocarbon in it. And nobody really knows what to make of that yet, but it's, it's an area of active study and an area that radiocarbon people are very concerned about. It's difficult to get an infinitely old standard that you can use to test radiocarbon dating. Even diamonds. <laughs> What are your thoughts or opinions on the Leviathan from the Bible or the other large beasts? Yeah. So we have in, in Job chapter 40 and 41, we have the story of Behemoth and Leviathan. Uh, I'll speak to Behemoth because I am a little more confident in that one. It has... It's a special thing that God made. He says that clearly in the text. It's God speaking. He's telling Job, where were you when I made Behemoth? Well, behemoth, this big giant animal that lives in the swamps, eats grass like an ox, has its strength in its hips, uh, has its, its ribs are like bars of iron, and it has a tail like a cedar tree. Well, folks, there's no other animal in existence that matches that except a duck-billed dinosaur, the one I study. It eats grass like an ox. It has, it has a tail like a cedar tree. It strengthens in its hips. That implies it walks on its hind legs. And all these characteristics match. But the problem is Job is after the flood, and, and Behemoth probably didn't exist after the flood. But when Job was alive, you know who else was alive? Noah. Noah, Noah and his sons. Wow. And besides, if I were to pass out a piece of paper to you and a pencil and ask you to draw a dragon, how many of you would draw a dragon? I mean, every kid in high school knows how to draw dragons. I don't know why there's such a fascinating... Well, I do know, but... <laughs> I suspect I know why there's such a fascination. But in any case, you've never seen a dragon, yet you can visualize one in your mind. So Job may never have seen this behemoth, but he heard about it. And so when God was talking, he said, look, what's the biggest thing I can think of that impressed Job? How about behemoth? He's heard about that. I made behemoth, God says. And it was a really special creature. So I think Behemoth is, is a dinosaur. I don't know what to do with Leviathan. Don't even know if it's the same creature or a different one. So that's, that's my take on it. That's my own personal opinion. It's not, it's not uh, from God. It's from me. What does the Bible say about cavemen or prehistoric man? <laughs> I, I don't think it really says anything. I think there certainly was a time when individuals 
who were both humans and other kinds of creatures, lived in caves, because we find a lot of evidence for this uh, in his fossils. Uh, I think what you mean by cavemen are, are these kind of half human, half something else kinds of creatures that we find in the fossil record. These are real. There are a lot of data that support the idea that there were intermediates between humans and, and some kind of ape, let's just say chimpanzee, because it makes it easy. And these creatures cause a lot of problems for creationists and in some respects for evolutionists as well. But for creationists, because we don't like to think that there's intermediates between humans and other creatures, and chimpanzees, let's say. But that's what they look like. And some of these creatures are, are even Neanderthals. Neanderthals are very much like humans. They have the, uh, a brain capacity bigger than modern humans on the average. And yet they have some ape characteristics. Um, if you take your finger and touch it to the tip of your chin, you'll feel a little bump there. That's called the mental eminence. And by the way, if you don't find it, tell me afterwards. Don't say anything to me. <laughs> That's present on humans and nobody else. Nobody else has that. Um, the extension of the lower jaw and the prognathism of a, a Neanderthal is marked. The occipital bun on the back of the skull is, is present in Neanderthal. These are all ape characteristics, and there are, a lot of, there are several others as well. Why does Neanderthal, which looks so much like humans and even buried their dead, why do they have these ape characteristics? Then going back further to Homo erectus and Homo habilis, and uh, clear on back to Australopithecus, all of these creatures have ape-like characteristics. No modern human has any of these characteristics. No modern human has any of the ape characteristics. But all of these fossil forms, the so-called fossil forms that are intermediate between humans and, and something else, chimpanzees, they all have these characteristics. I, one thing comes to mind is the idea that humans and chimpanzees were exchanging genetic material. That's a pleasant way of saying interbreeding. So, uh, so then I would reach back into some things that Ellen White says about the crossing of humans and chimpanzees, or uh, she says man and beast, but I just say it that way. Uh, so the question is, can this kind of a cross actually happen? I happen to be on a listserv of paleoanthropologists. These are professional people that work on fossil man. And they were having a discussion about the possibility of creating a hybrid. And one of the individuals said that this, this had been done at least twice that she knew of, and that uh, it had been terminated at the, fir third, at the first trimester uh, in order to avoid the moral problems of, of bringing one of these into, into the world. So that seems to suggest that it is possible, it can be done, it has been done, and as time goes on, it may well be done again. The next comments in this particular series of discussions were, had nothing to do with challenging what she said. Everybody pretty much agreed that it had been done. But one guy said, we better not let the creationists hear about this. Now, why wouldn't he want the creationists to hear about it? Because that would explain the intermediates in the fossil record. It would give a good explanation for that. That would take away this argument that they're trying to promote that man has evolved from, from ape-like characters. So I, I put that out there for what it's worth. I think it's a reasonable suggestion. Uh, and just last week there was a man on um, a can't remember, he wrote an article in a major publication, science publication, suggesting that we ought to do these experiments again, that we ought to produce these human-chimp hybrids so that we could show the creationists that they're wrong. So, you know, you can't have it both ways. You, 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 but they want it both ways. So, anyway, it, it is out there. It's an idea that I think is, is well understood in the community. It's not talked about much. 
but it seems to be something that could happen. I don't know if that answered your question, but it went all around it. <laughs> <laughs> um, in what way was the Earth divided in Peleg's time? That's a really good question. <laughs> uh, the two hypotheses that have the most light in them, one is that this was about the time of the Tower of Babel and that the dividing of the earth meant the splitting of man off into, into various areas. The other is the idea that the earth has broken up and split apart. And I don't have any light on which of those is the best fit. I know that according to the fossil record, the breakup of Pangaea is something that happened before the end of the flood. I'm pretty sure of that. In that case, it wouldn't have been uh, in the days of Pele. So to me, I give a slight uh, slight edge to the idea that this is, has to do with the breaking up of humans and spreading them over the Earth's surface. It's clear to me why God broke the Earth up. North America and South America, we wouldn't be here if, if it hadn't been for plate tectonics. And that means there would have been no place of refuge for God's truth from what was happening in Europe. There wouldn't have been a place where he could preserve his truth for a, a longer period of time. And so uh, God preserved this land so that his truth could be preserved. And I, I think that's a very important part of the great controversy. And uh, plate tectonics is the mechanism that he used. Now, did it happen at, a, at the current rate? The current rate of movement is about uh, four centimeters in some, some of these plates, four centimeters per year. And we can measure that accurately using the same GPS equipment that I use out in the field. And so uh, the only good thing I can say is that we're moving farther away from France every year. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, it, it, is, uh, it is, at this rate, though, it would have taken millions of years for, for this split to have taken place. So John Baumgartner, who's a geophysicist, developed a model in which he was um, showing that these plates could move very fast and that once they started subducting, once the plate started going down into the mantle, its own weight would pull it on down. And that's easy to model, and, and he's quite certain about that. And furthermore, he has shown, other people have shown, that these plates, when they reach the core of the Earth, so they go clear down through the mantle until they hit the core, and the core is more dense, so it can't, it can't uh, penetrate the core, but as it goes down, it's, it's cooler and therefore heavier than the surrounding rocks. So it goes down. But of course, over time, hundreds of thousands of years, this mantle, this uh, crustal rock that's gone down into the, into the mantle should be in equilibrium temperature-wise. It should melt and disappear. But they found out that these, these big subducting plates are still there and they're still cold. So it doesn't look like it's happened uh, slowly. It looks like it's happened very fast. And that supports Baumgartner's ideas of, of rapid plate tectonics. Of course, it would not be a pleasant place to be around while this was going on. So I think probably it did happen before uh, Noah got out of the ark. I just have one more question, and then we'll open it up and let you all ask some questions. Um, how long did uh, dinosaurs live? How long was their lifespan? There's, do you have any idea? Now that's a question that's much debated, and the reasons are, are pretty clear. Even though we have some ways of telling how old a dinosaur is, the dinosaurs, like modern crocodiles, produce a growth ring in their bone every year. And so you can just go look at a cross sec look at a thin section of the bone. You actually cut the bone through, and then glue it to a slide, and cut it off the slide, and then make a very, very thin section of bone so you can see light through it. It's beautiful. We have some on the wall in the museum where you can see this. Uh, and incidentally, you can also see that the, the whole internal structure of the bone is still there, including the cells. You can see the actual cells, nucleus in the, in the cells in the bone is still preserved. 
something that would be impossible in 65 million years in anybody's reckoning. But the number of measurements that you can get is, so, so you can just count these rings, and the one that we were looking at was Nanotyrannus, and we counted seven or eight or nine rings in, in this particular specimen. So that would mean it was seven or eight or nine years old, except the bone is growing all the time and it's remodeling constantly. So the bone is reworking inside and it gets rid of those growth lines. So only in exceptional circumstances could you see growth, growth lines all the way through the bone. So it's very difficult to pin it down. And so people argue on the basis of physiology, on the basis of life behavior, and on the basis of what kinds of dinosaurs we find. For example, in T-Rex, we find adult T-Rexes. We have quite a few of those, about 30. We have zero juvenile T-Rexes, or close to it. So how can you have so many adults and so few juveniles? And uh, one of the arguments that's used to deal with that data, those data is that the dinosaurs grew very fast. So they would grow up to adulthood in one year, and then from then on they just kind of sat around. So those kinds of arguments made based on those kind of data are, are interesting, but they're conjectural, and we don't really have a good handle on that question, how long they live. It looks like some of them can live into the 30s at least. By the way, those were exceptional questions. I don't know <laughs> how you came up with some such good questions. Thank you. Well, I've loved dinosaurs for as long as I can remember. <laughs> and she's not a boy, she's a girl. <laughs> yeah, that was a sexist comment, wasn't it? <laughs> but it's true that more guys than girls go after dinosaurs. Go, going back to uh, the, the correlation between Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon and, and man in the creation theory there, what about, the, uh, what about the, the scripture in the Bible that says, and the sons of Noah looked upon the, son, the daughters of man and found them attractive. Do you think that those daughters of men might have been from the Cro-Magnon? Isn't Cro-Magnon more human? Okay. Uh, that particular species, Cro-Magnon, is a, is a modern human, and they have a larger brain capacity than we do today. So, but they're after the flood. They were after. Yeah, and the statement from Scripture you're giving me is from before the flood, and it basically means that the sons of God are always in Scripture taken to mean the sons of Seth. And the daughters of men would be the sons of, the daughters of Cain. Okay. And so you have the godly people intermarrying with the godless people, and God knew that this was the end of, of a race that he could preserve, and that's why the flood came. So, so that's, there are people that try to make fanciful explanations about angels interacting with men, but angels are not sexual beings. There's, there's no he and she angels. The angels are angels. And, and I think uh, just as Jesus said, in heaven they're not marrying and giving in marriage. I think uh, this, this planet is, is unique in the universe among God's creation in that one thing that he made, he gave us that we, we have managed to pretty much destroy is the ability to procreate. He said he's making man in his image. What is it about God's image that he made man that gave him capabilities like God? Uh, we take it for granted that we're going to have children. It's not something you can take for granted. It's an amazing miracle that defies explanation outside of the work of a creator God. How can you take one being and make two out of it? Mm -hmm. It happens in human beings. And, and so Satan 
is jealous because he can't do that. And God gave it to these beings, so why should he allow these beings to exist? Because they have what he wants. And um, it's just, that's, that's my take on it. I, I, but I am so much in awe that God can, can make beings that can make beings. It's just, it's just something is so natural. So, of course, Satan has destroyed it. He's, he's distorted that, the whole interaction between male and female and everything else about it in our culture to try to, try to take any, any redemptive quality from it. But after all, God is amazing, and, and it's, it shows up through that. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to say something about that. I was just thinking about that on yesterday because I have a great grandbaby, and I just sit and think about the way babies are born. There is so many people on this earth, but each baby is so unique. It's, it's such a miracle of God. The people take it for granted, but each baby is a miracle. Well, I walked back here to give the mic to her. You mentioned last night that uh, there were no dinosaurs in the Dominican Republic. Is that uncommon around the world, or is it just lots no. of places? Uh, there are dinosaurs on every continent. Oh. The Dominican Republic is a fairly small island. They do have some Cretaceous sediments there. But they're marine, so they let, you wouldn't expect to find dinosaurs in them. And they, are, they haven't been looked at very much. But they haven't been found there. But they're found in any, any place you can find terrestrial sediments from the Mesozoic, the Jurassic, the Cretaceous. Uh, you can find dinosaurs. Cool. So God called... All the So God called all the animals of all kinds to go onto the ark. How does that apply to dinosaurs and if no dinosaurs were on the ark why would that not be okay uh, the word all is used many times in the flood account to describe how many animals uh, are in the ark or, or which which animals are in the ark uh, and even Ellen White uses all that way to describe the animals in the ark all the all the ones that were not polluted by by man were in the ark and so people infer that dinosaurs were were polluted and therefore they weren't in the ark but Ellen White makes a statement to the contrary that deals with that she says there was a class of very large animals before the flood there's only one class of very large animals that's dinosaurs that, that God did not see fit to preserve in the ark not because they were corrupted or polluted but because man in his weakened condition after the flood wouldn't be able to get along with him. I think, and that's a paraphrase, that last part. I'm not exactly sure of the wording there, but um, it's pretty clear that one T-Rex on the ark would have been one too many because... <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> because a, a T-Rex doesn't have babies. They lay eggs, and they lay 25 eggs in a clutch. And that makes 25 T-Rexes the next time around, and then 625, and oh then thousands, you know. And they could easily overwhelm man. Okay. Now, in pre-flood world, if people were really as big as we understand that they were, at least twice as big as we are today, they could handle T-Rex and not too much of a problem, right? We handle horses. They're bigger than us. Um, <coughs> We, we wouldn't have had trouble with him if we stayed as big as we are and strong as uh, big as he was and strong as he was. But that didn't last very long. After the flood, people went downhill really fast. And I think God saw that he, that he would be destroying man again if he left these animals. So he says, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait, save that for them when they get to heaven. Uh, if you don't like dinosaurs, you're probably going to see them again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my question was, and maybe I should break it up in two pieces. Um, is it possible that maybe the dinosaurs weren't on the ark because they were not created by God? Could they, in other words, could they have come about because due to amalgamation? Yeah, that, that's the answer. The question I was just trying to answer. 
Number one, the story in Job sounds like he's talking about a dinosaur and God says these were especially important to me when I made them. And number two, the statement of Ellen White says the reason why they weren't on the ark is because of man, not because they were bad creatures. So those two to taken together uh, give me a sense that these, these animals are really special, but God decided to save it for a dessert. So, yeah, that's, that's, that is my interpretation. I have a question. Um, Ellen White writes about amalgamation of the man and the beast in the same sentences that um, will now reflect God's image. And I was, some people have two understanding about that sentence that the man was sleeping with the beast, the way how you put it. And some people can define that actually no, was amalgamation man with man and beast with beast. But man to man, we procreate and we reflect God's image. Uh, only if man with a beast, then you don't reflect God's image. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to believe that that synthesis is more regarding the man with the beast mm -hmm. procreating. Yeah, um, if, and the, the context of that sentence is if there was one, after she talks about rape and murder and, and robbery and, and every other base crime that you can imagine, then she says if there was one sin above another, one sin above another that brought the flood and the destruction of the world and the flood, it was the base crime, base crime of amalgamation of man with man. Come on. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. In uh, Romania, uh, even during the communism was a story about a lady sleeping with a horse. Then when I read her quotation to me, it seems that she's referring to the man with the beast. Yeah, I, I think there's no doubt about that. Any other questions? Uh, go ahead, sure. Are ghosts real? Oh, are ghosts real? Are ghosts real? Well, I, I am not a expert in that area. <laughs> um, I was uh, last two weeks ago. I was in Virginia giving a talk, and a man uh, who came to the meetings was was a uh, man that made his living telling stories about ghosts. He had a he had a amusement park where you, people would come there and do all this stuff. Uh, he convinced me that that it was nonsense, <laughs> even though he made his living at it. Uh, but even Jesus says that these are not ghosts. I'm not a ghost. When he appeared in the middle of the room, the guy, his disciples got scared. So this, the idea of ghosts being around is not a new one. And I think it has to do with the spirits of, of demons. And uh, spirits of demons are real. There's, there's no doubt in my mind. I don't want to ever mess with one, but I've read books about people that mess with them, and you don't want to mess with them. But, but yeah, I, I think there are things that we call ghosts. They are not what we think of as ghosts, which is departed saints. But they are, they are the spirits of demons. And when Jesus appeared in that room, he says, look, I'm not a ghost, touch me. So, so yeah, it could be a, like a hologram. I don't, I don't know what it is. Hi, Dr. Chadwick. Hi, Sherry. <laughs> it's, it's so good to see you again. Really special. Brings back a lot of memories of getting to listen to you in classes and all. And I wanted to say what a blessing it was that you were such an amazing professor that... <laughs> Not only were you brilliant with all your <laughs> many doctorates and all and all your education, you're out there astronomical in your brilliance, but yet you're very humble, you and Dr. Clayton, Mr. Peter. Really a blessing to, ha to have you all as professors. You, I always felt you had our students back and all, but not only were you inter concerned about our education, but um, our Christian life too, our relationship with God. <laughs> Sorry, I'm crying. I wasn't expecting this. Uh -huh. 
but um, I, it was, I always uh, appreciated and respected how you started each of your lectures with a devotion, you know, getting our mindset towards God before we studied. And, and uh, like you say, laying out all the different theories and all, you know, I, it meant a lot to me that you shared your testimony about you becoming a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and how you chose to uh, set aside the Sabbath as time for God. Of course, you made a big point of memorizing scripture to, to memory every day and setting aside time for God every day, but that you chose to not study at all on Sabbath. And you know, as a college university student, that's a huge chunk of time that it's tempting to try to study on the Sabbath. <laughs> but I, I followed your example, and I just wanted to tell you thank you. I'm convinced to this day that that's the only reason I ever finally finished my <laughs> biology degree and my physical therapy degree, because I followed your example. I think God bless that. I also remember in one of your lectures, you, they were talking about the dinosaurs before a f flood and why didn't he save them on the... On the ark, I remember you saying something, uh, you know, just a possible idea how, you know, because humans and all were bigger than two, and that the change in the atmosphere and all too. So I, I wanted to uh, see if that jogged your memory to make, maybe make a comment about that. But then also, I listened to Christians on, you know, public radio and all coming, you know, up in arms, all been against science or whatever, you know, attacking science and. I always remember it in your classes, but especially for philosophy of science class, that is eternally one of my favorite classes that you taught, that you would say true science doesn't contradict the Bible. True science is in alignment with the Bible, and how I have wished that non-believers and Christians alike could hear your messages of all your research that you did in the Grand Canyon and your dino dig and everything, and how it, it, true science doesn't contradict the Bible. It is in alignment with the Bible. Uh, I uh, wish more people could hear your message, and I wondered if you've, if you've talked to some of the other Christian scientists that are on 3ABN or HOPE or uh, some of those uh, Christian scientists. I know the father-son duo talking about the carbon uh, testing with fossils and all, uh, that uh, they made that, I didn't know if you'd ever heard them, how they created a fossil, fossil about two months in their lab, I think it was. And then they took it to outside lab that, you know, independent lab that did that carbon data testing or whatever it is. And it showed that, that it was millions of years old that they had made it in two months in their, their lab. So it's kind of interesting that kind of proves or shows anyways that, that uh, not so reliable with that carbon uh, testing. Well, thank you for that testimony. <laughs> yeah, what can I say? Um, I, I will say something about the atmosphere of the Earth. That this this idea has been promoted by a man named Carl Baugh. If you know who Carl Baugh is, he lives down in Glen Rose. He's a Baptist minister who claims to be a PhD, but he really doesn't doesn't have any training in science at all. And uh, he he got this idea from someone, and we actually did experiments. Sherry Sherry was a uh, cohort with my children, my son and my daughter, and especially my son uh, did some experiments in, while he was in college on this idea that, that things grew faster and more oxygen. But the problem is if you increase the oxygen level in the atmosphere, uh, it becomes explosive once you get over 20 percent. 20 percent is about as far as you can go, and that's why in the hospital they always have all these warnings around not to smoke when you're around oxygen. And that's no small thing, by the way. Uh, a cigarette in the presence of an oxygen container will blow up uh, instantly. There's some videos on this where they pour liquid nitrogen on charcoal and set it on fire, and it burns instantly. It burns all the charcoal up and also destroys the <laughs> container they're in and <laughs> everything else. So it is an amazing thing. Uh, how, how, how much oxygen you can have in the atmosphere. But if you double the pressure without increasing the percentage of oxygen, uh, you might have a better growth because the amount of oxygen available is, is increased. And so he did these experiments with fish because obviously in fish it's a lot easier to increase the, carbon, the oxygen concentration. You just bubble it through the water, whereas in any other organism you have to have a big pressure chamber that would... That would uh, increase the, the pressure. And he found out that, that fish do grow better under higher oxygen concentrations. I'm not sure why plants would, because plants, uh, oxygen's a byproduct. It'd be harder for them to get rid of it if there were more pressure. Uh, but uh, 
in animals, it does seem to improve their performance, their growth. But still, that's an area that's very speculative, and I, I don't have any real light on it. That experiment's the only one I know of that's ever been done. <laughs> Uh, Doctor, speaking about the, the dinosaurs and the ark, um, most of them were very large animals or obese, but there were several of them that were very small. Uh, yeah. An explanation on this, why these very small ones didn't make it onto it, uh, or is there evidence that maybe some did made it into it, very small ones, and they just didn't survive the, the new uh, environment after the flood? Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to argue that one way or the other. I, I don't feel any strongly about it. It's just that she talks about a class. And a class is, is a technical term to which dinosaurs fit very well. And so I would think that maybe God said, okay, they're big ones, they're little ones, but let's just take a whole bunch of them and save them for later. And I think that's kind of the way I've gone in my thinking. But yeah, there could have been some on the ark that survived and uh, didn't leave a record, and would explain why we have references to dinosaur-like things in various places around the world. But the, unfortunately, the references are always to the big ones. So that we don't have any evidence for. I think that'll conclude our program. Um, oh, got one more. Um, you make a movie. Uh, you make a movie on Tony So. Yeah, we we have made a movie of our excavation site. It's being done by the Hope Channel. They spent a month out there with a crew of 10 people filming us last year. It's not a home movie, it's a, it's a real production, a documentary, and it should be out sometime in the near future, and this will give you a real taste for what goes on out there, so. What's your name? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know what the title is. Uh, I know it's being produced by a very good producer, it is not going to be talking heads. He doesn't want to have any talking heads in the whole movie. So, so it should be something very uh, exciting and interesting. Wonderful. Okay. Yes. Um, the other day you mentioned you were in a pickup truck and you were going to get out and you saw these bones. Well, wouldn't the vehicle, being as heavy as this, crush the bone that's already there? Yeah. He didn't care. He had lots. <laughs> he had 8,000 acres of it. <laughs> It didn't mean that much to him, it meant a lot to me. And it, it, it really triggered me being interested in that. And, and uh, as I said, I, I really didn't need another project at that time, but this stimulated me for the right reason, I think, to get involved in this project, which is to save data, preserve it for future generations. And everything we've done, you saw the website and all that, we've done with this in mind, that we want to this to be available to anybody at any time. So we don't keep our data and proprietary, we make it all available on the web. What is your website? I missed last night's presentation. It's easy. It's fossil.southwesternadventistuniversity, S-W-A-U, S-W-A-U dot E-D-U, education. Okay. Okay. I want to ask a question. Has there been enough DNA found that some fool might try to clone one? <laughs> Uh, certainly not if they're 65 million years old. <laughs> Doctor, uh, most of the focus about uh, work on the site has been uh, um, about the, the activities in June. Uh, do you have any ongoing year-round activities at the site? Is there ongoing research that just, you know, ad infinitum? Well, there's there's infinite amount of work to be done there. Uh, we uh, restrain ourselves because we get so many bones in that one month that we can't process them during the year. And one of my goals is, as I said, to make this data available. It's not available if it's sitting in a box somewhere. So I try to get all the bones we have processed. And I just got a grant last year for 
sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars to hire somebody to work full time to hire a crew to work full time getting us caught up because we're behind. No, no, this is all in Keene. Oh, okay. gotcha. <laughs> all right. I think that'll conclude our program. Let's have closing prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for a wonderful program today. And please help all of us to get home safely. And Please bless Dr. Chadwick as he returns home. And thank you for blessing us with all of this wonderful knowledge. Amen.